the Koigig Pod on Off the Ball in association with Cadbury, official snack partner of the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Katie McCabe, a huge, huge goal. I'm very proud of the team's performance. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig podcast. Kathleen McNamee here with you as always to look ahead to the start of Ireland's European qualifying campaign and also to look back on all the action from the weekend in the WSL and the Conti Cup where things got a little bit heated but uh, who doesn't love to see a little bit of managerial spice being brought into the game. Joining me to look back on all this as ever is Captain Karen Duggan and then a little bit later on we'll be having the one and only Jilly Flaherty alongside us to look ahead a little bit to England and also look at all that league action as mentioned. But Karen, how are you? How was your weekend? My weekend was good. Surprisingly fresh after a bank holiday. So I'm ready for it this week. (laughs) That's what we like to hear. A bit of freshness after a bank holiday is always nice. And it's a beautiful sunny day in Dublin, which is adding to the feels of it's actually not the worst bank holiday uh, Tuesday back. Um, Karen, We'll start with a bit of Ireland because we will be going into the WSL a little bit later on when we have Jilly here. A couple of days out, we've been talking about these games a lot over the last weeks since we learned who our opponents are going to be. A couple of days out, what are the feels? Have they settled at all or are you still a little bit <laughs> anxious? We had the news today, very unfortunately, that Nifahi definitely isn't going to be available for either game with a calf strain. So that's a bit of a blow, but I think we expected it after Matt Beard's comments last week. Yeah, we did expect it, but it's it's still disappointing because I think she's um, such an influential character on the team and she is the type of player who brings other players' games up. Um, and particularly after the last display against Wales, the back line was uncharacteristically shaky mm. um, and that needs to be absolutely nailed on point if we're going to keep France at bay and obviously England then after that. Um, have the fields changed? You know, you, you get yourself a little bit optimistic and then I've started kind of like looking into the France team and you're looking at the players that they have and the quality that they have and the amount of players they have in the Champions League semi-finals, obviously between Lyon and, and PSG and you're... It doesn't... Doesn't make for great reading, but I think we know what we're going into. I think we've experienced this before going up against teams that are much higher ranked than us. And essentially it's a shot at nothing because we expect to not do particularly well in this group, but it's all building towards that qualifying playoff. And I think that's at the forefront of my mind. So I'm really just looking forward to seeing how we perform and see is there a difference between our performances were like under Veer at the World Cup when again we were punching above our weight and what Eileen does and if there's any difference to that. So I think that that'll just be interesting from an analysis point of view. Mm. And there is the side of things that we do kind of know what we're getting ourselves into with France and that we have played them in recent memory. I know that game was a little bit different and we were still in that pre-World Cup stage where people were trying to prove themselves and it wasn't necessarily an entirely settled squad in the same way that we have now and this has the competitive edge, which makes it different. But I've been reassuring myself over recent weeks that at least with Sweden and France, there's that history there and it's not a total unknown in the way that it might be going up against the European champions. Yeah, now the history isn't fantastic because if we do think back to that pre-World Cup game, the, the gulf was was pretty evident that day. Um, France, when they needed to turn it on, looked like they were more than capable of doing that. Um, obviously, La Samir, she got a couple of goals in that game. She's still a big, you know, she's been around for a long time, but she's still a, a big player for this France team. But I, I assume we'll be looking at Team of the Week in a while and you're looking at the likes of Kenza Daly and then it's how does our midfield nullify that kind of creative threat that they do have um, they are different to Sweden you know they they are a bit more um, versatile in how they play um, Sweden we know what to expect a little bit more because we came up against them in those high pressure European or World Cup qualifiers but um, I think that France do have more variety about them but they are also 
unpredictable and we hope that they go down that unpredictable and not altogether cohesive route when we play them. But I assume that they'll be wanting to put a mark out as well. You know, it's the first uh, round of their campaign. They'll see themselves as going for that top spot. I know that the the group is hugely competitive and I suppose England are the favourites there. But when you look at that France squad, I wouldn't back a bet against them. Mm. I wouldn't go, would you call it a shock if they beat England? Probably not. No, That's probably That's how close not. I think that they are to that. Well, that's the thing with this French team, and I've said it so much on here and also on off the ball in general, is that for so long they've had so much potential and they just haven't been able to really tap into it. And a lot of that's probably based on the coach that was there before. And I think a lot of people thought that Hervé Renard would come in and maybe be the man to unlock the magic. And he has to a certain extent. He nearly was. He nearly did. You know, yeah. you think back to the penalties in the World Cup and how that could have gone differently. But um, he's. I do think he's brought them to a better level. I do think that they're, they seem more settled, at mm-hmm. least. And that's always a scary thing when it comes to France. One of the questions that we had in from our listeners was what qualities does this Irish squad have that could trouble the French most if we were to look at an area that we could get some sort of positive results? And you can't just say Katie McCabe. (laughs) No, I think if we're talking about a result, we're talking about a draw. And Mm -hmm. I think if we're talking about a draw, we know that we have the ability to frustrate really, really top teams if we don't get completely overrun in midfield. So we know we're probably going to go to the five at the back, but I doubt we'll go 5-3-2. I think it will be more of a 5-4-1 with Caruso up top, trying to run the lines and kind of pull Renard out a bit. She did cause her a little bit of trouble. We have seen that before and she has capabilities of doing that. Um, And we have Denise O'Sullivan back. So she's going to bring a lot in terms of the engine and her defensive work goes really under the radar as well because she's so prominent in our attack and she's so key to our attack. But I think if we can really stagnate that middle area that we have a, a good chance because we're going to be sitting low. We're going to be out to frustrate them. And they are a team that can be frustrated. We've seen that when things don't go right for them, they can go start to go really wrong for them. And we would hope that that would happen. So I think it's that middle part of the field, getting that right, getting those distances right, is going to be really, really big for us. Making the pitch as small as possible, you know, could not letting them get pace and runners in behind we saw that their fullbacks caused us a lot of problems when we played them in Tala so just taking the learnings from that I know that that you might think that that was a long time ago but I would look back at those matches that their squad hasn't changed a huge amount since then so we know what to expect doesn't make it any easier but it's better to it's better than an unknown quantity I think definitely I remember walking up to Sydney Opera House and seeing someone very tall walking in front of me and I was like, oh, some of those backs of those heads look kind of familiar. And it was like Wendy Renard, Eugénie Le Sommer, like half the French team, basically. And wow, <laughs> they yeah. are some They're physical athletes. team. Yeah. yeah, they are athletes. I was walking alongside them feeling very small and very <laughs> insignificant. Um, so that'll be an interesting Yeah, it'll shot. be interesting to see if physicality plays into to Eileen's selection, whether she goes for, you know, more defensive-minded players in that middle of the field. Maybe your Jesse Stapleton, does she provide more of a physical presence than someone mm. else she might be thinking of more in like a 10 role? Um, so it'll be interesting to see if there's if there's much change um, based on the opposition. Jesse Stapleton is an interesting name to bring up because she was asked about Anna Patton coming into the squad, which... After all week, everyone being like, oh, yeah, there's going to be no surprises in this squad. And then all of a sudden, uh, she comes out of nowhere. So she qualifies to her grandparents. Um, her grandfather is from Falcara in Donegal, and her grandmother is from Lenamore in Galway. Played with Galway, or play, played with Galway, played with Ireland at underage, or played with England. Jesus, I can't speak today. Played with England at underage levels was always quite strongly linked to the English team. But obviously we've seen the strength and depth that that team has. It's very, very hard to break into. And at 24, it's understandable that she's potentially looking for other opportunities to play. Played with Katie McCabe and got on really well with her at Arsenal um, before moving away. Interesting that we're bringing in more players. What do you think a player like Anna Patton can give to this team? I mean, she's playing 
week in, week out, WSL. And we always speak about game time. And that's why a lot of the girls have had to drop to the championship. Anna Patton is getting game time at the top level, you know, so week in, week out, she's coming up against players who are, you know, maybe close to the the talent that they're going to face from your likes of your Leons and your PSG players. She's now coming up against your Arsenals and your Chelsea's and players like that. So she has that experience. She has international experience, obviously, with England, but she uh, played at the, the higher end of the age grades there. So she does have international experience as well. Um, someone's working hard out there. Someone has a login to Ancestry DNA anyway. <laughs> it's been a bit of a pattern that, that's come particularly since just before the World Cup. But when the player is of the calibre that Anna Patton is, we, we can't really say no to that, I don't think. Um, and she's also a versatile player. So I think that there's potentially space for both players if we go with a, a a two two sixes mm. um, Anna Patton can obviously play full back or centre back as well and then you've got Aoife Mannion there as well so it, it will be interesting to see obviously Louise Quinn is back I think she will come back into the starting squad just because of the presence and the experience that she gives but there is the options there with Mannion Caitlin Hayes you've got Anna Patton there now so that's a, that's probably the most interesting position Um we saw that we got a little bit caught for pace maybe in, in previous games. I don't think that will be an issue because we will play the lower line midfield. So it will be interesting to see if Caitlin Hayes retains her place when that competition is coming in from your Aoife Mannions and mm. your Anna Pattons who are obviously playing WSL. But on the flip side of that, if we are to attack, a lot of our stuff will come through set pieces. And again, Hayes on the score sheet again, you'll have Hayes and Louise Quinn. So I think that that potentially could feed into Eileen's choice as well. And if you were Eileen and you were to pick, which players would you go with? Mm, Louise centrally. Um, then I would go with Anna Patton. And I haven't seen enough of Eva Mannion. I didn't watch the full United game the other day. Um, it's a tough one between Hayes and Mannion for me mm. uh, I suppose it depends as well on Mannion's fitness um, I can't so remember. yeah potentially but would you be as well to start her yeah rather than Hayes coming in but then obviously it's going to be a really hard game to come in as a centre back you don't tend it's like in the GA it's always a corner four that gets taken off <laughs> so it's usually like a winger or a striker that gets taken <laughs> off um, so uh I think they might start Hayes because then you've got Mannion to come in. Mm. We know that Heather Payne will run all day, but can she realistically do that? And what's asked of her? So the wing backs are going to be under a lot of pressure to get up and down the line. So we saw Mannion play full back. So that versatility that she gives, she gives more versatility from the bench than Hayes does. And if we are sitting reviewing this on Wednesday and the two games have finished... Is our ideal situation a draw and a l- loss? Two draws? Yes. A draw and a loss? Uh, like two draws, obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Be, you know, um, if we're if we're saying our prayers now, yeah, two draws. I think, I think a draw out of the two games would be great and would give a lot of confidence looking forward towards the Sweden games in particular, which if for some reason we have decided we're going to get points in. Well, I think it's the only one that we can look at and say, okay, we Historically, have... Historically, we have a bit of yeah. pedigree there, yeah. We we have a chance. And it should There's be a up. chance. There's always a chance. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, speaking of, before we move on to our team of the week, I just want to very quickly ask you about the weekend's action in the league here because it was exciting. Wall-to-wall it was stuff. Exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, it was Yeah, it was. Um, we nearly saw kind of a clean sweep of surprises, only that Galway pulled it out of the bag against Sligo right at, at the death. But it, it was keeps so rude them on them. top. So rude. I know. I know. I could have given you a big bank holiday boost, but yeah. a fair play to, to Sligo. They really, really put it up to them. Um, shows the development there because, like I said, I think Galway are they're absolutely flying it and they're well worth their place on the top of that. I suppose the standout game was always going to be Athlone and Shells. 
Um, a lot of people would have tipped them at the start of the year. They were obviously the cup finalists last year, Athlone coming out on top there. Um, only to be... Yeah, so it was it was a tight one. Obviously, Maddie Gibson on the score sheet right at the at the death. I think that Shelburne would be a little bit disappointed having held them out for so long in Athlone. That pitch is big, but mm. tired legs. But she was just given too much space at the edge of the box, and she's just too good of a player to to uh, to allow that much space. So um, I don't know if either of them will be overly happy with that, but you know, it's still a point gained more than anything. Um, and another big story, I guess, is Cork getting points on the board against Bose. That was a really big result for them. Yeah. And it, for it to be happening this early in the season is good. It will give them a lot more confidence um, considering where they were coming from from last season. A lot of people doubting them and stuff. So that will give them great belief going forward. Um, and Treaty United drawing with Shamrock Rovers in Tallah Stadium. I think that that's significant, the fact that it was in Tallah Stadium. Um and yeah, Treaty really the unknown quantity because of all the new players, the Canadian players that have come in um, and certainly adding, adding to the excitement and to the shocks of the weekend. So it's definitely the weirdest kind of maybe start to a season because everyone everyone's dropping points. Mm. I expected it, but if you were just going off form of previous years, you probably wouldn't have expected um, that at this point three games in. I'm enjoying it, I have to say, as a spectator. It's making for far more interesting viewing. And you feel like every game you go into, the, it's not the same certainty going into them that a certain team is going to get a yeah. result. Which... And even say for us as players previously, you'd be like, oh, we've dropped points now. We're really, we're going, we could struggle to get that back. But because everyone is dropping points, we, we won a game at the weekend and now we're, all of a sudden we're right back in it, you know. So I think there's going to be a lot of ebbing and flowing uh, as it goes on. Um, people are still finding their feet a little bit and obviously we have another break now. Um, then I think after this international break is when teams will really kick on and we'll start to see a few more front runners. But yeah, all exciting so far. I love a bit of neutral. It. <laughs> Karen's like I want a stress free year yeah. please everyone else drop points and not pee melt please and thank you yeah, yeah. Um, sadly we don't have any Emma Carroll this week but she very kindly did actually send us a team of the week because um, she was laid up and had lots of time to watch football which is <laughs> great for us Karen um, so I will run through this and then we can have a bit of a chat off the back of it before we go to Jilly Flaherty to look at the weekend's action so in goal she has Leeds Cup and then back line of Sophie Howard, Alex Greenwood and Taylor Hines, Lisa Nelson, Kenza Daly, Ella Toon, Jess Park and then Lucia Garcia, Lauren Hemp and Bunny Shaw. I feel like Bunny Shaw should just has like gotten that permanent position yeah, in the team. She's captain of the team of the week. Let's yeah. just leave it at that. She's undroppable <laughs> from team of the week. Her goal um, at the weekend was... It was outrageous. I actually, my jaw was on the floor. And it was the little touch around the centre defender that she meant. And then as soon as it hit or left her foot, it was game over. Like it was <laughs> nearly burst the net. Um, and she has that now. She can score from outside the box. She's obviously got a header as well. So, yeah, Bunny Shaw keeps in the form that she's in now. You God help put, us all. You near, God help us all, but you nearly put City as favourites, I think she's that big of an influence on the team. Definitely. Um, it's, she kind of reminds me of when Miedema first came to Arsenal and before her injury and she had those couple of record-breaking seasons and it just gave you such a certainty about how Arsenal were going to perform and the fact that no matter what, even if it was a semi not great performance, she would pop up and get a goal. She's unmarkable, essentially. Mm. So even if, yeah, the team you say are underperforming, you give her a few chances... It'll be great. And she can create chances herself as well, just with the, the power that she has. So, yeah, she's certainly worth her place there. Um, in terms of the, the rest of the team, I mean, there was a lot of people on par. So it was, we could we could debate it a lot. I wouldn't take too many people out. I, I'd have, Obviously, Heinz came on at halftime for Liverpool and Liverpool were were taking a battering there. Mm. So um, I don't know if you'd put a Liverpool player in um, just because there was a, it was a City's game all day, you know, reading. Mm. Um, after I, the first I do actually game. have Emma's reasoning for this. 
And she okay. said, <laughs> she likes to send me notes just to make sure that we don't uh, okay. take her too out of uh, context or anything. She said, uh, came back, played second half and was excellent, changed the game for Liverpool, probably should claim the goal, but also it's a pity because they lost the game in about a 25 minute period and she could have had more of an impact. <laughs> okay, yeah, like, nah. In hindsight, I don't think anyone was stopping Man City at the weekend. Um, I think that they were unbelievable. Um, and with that, I possibly would have looked at Alexandri coming into that back line. Um, they were just so fluid everywhere, though. Everyone was all everyone was setting up attacks. So yeah, Greenwood was in there doing the business. Um, and every week, I just love watching Hasegawa. So. Um, but I won't take it away from Nasland because it's good to see a bit of Man United representation. I feel like it's been a while since we've had uh, something to talk about there. But even saying that, Lucia Garcia, yeah, she was she was instrumental to the things United did and she brings that energy and pace. And I think that a lot of people need to kind of follow suit with her. But at the same time, Mary Fowler is keeping Chloe Kelly out of Man City's team. Um, and she was excellent again at the weekend. Um, yeah, Emma did have Mary yeah. Fowler as one of her all in a row mentions. Um, yeah. And also another name that she mentions, which is one that I had, was Mom Kiki. Thought she was really yes. impressive for Leicester. Yeah, big time. Yeah, like the Leicester Villa game um, was interesting because, again, you've got Howard in there for City, but I thought Moritz was really good for Villa. So both ends of the pitch, they were both doing really well. But definitely Mamiki, you know, Villa got the first goal. Mamiki came back and responded almost straight away and um, had a really good performance in that that midfield area. A lot of central players in there today. We're after pushing... Uh, We've got Jess Park, we've got Ella Toon, uh, Dali, Naslund. Yeah, a lot of, lot of central players, but they were all, I'm really, all worth their place, you'd have to say. Yeah, I'm really intrigued to see if Jess Park gets many minutes um, against Ireland at the Aviva next week, because I feel like she's just been... <laughs> I, I don't want to see it necessarily. I don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't even know what I want to see. I don't know if I want to see that because she's not a regular starter for England or if it terrifies me because she's in absolutely outrageous form for mm. Man City. Well, we... I don't know. I, it's Brian Panfire. Yeah, I know. I don't really know what a good outcome is or a good place, but uh, hopefully we will get a little bit more about that with Julie Flaherty when she joins us now to look ahead to the WSL or to the international action next week and also look back on the WSL action over the weekend. And now we are delighted to be joined by the one and only Jilly Flaherty, who's quick becoming a good friend of the podcast over the last few weeks. Jilly, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Doing well, doing well. We're um, a little bit intimidated heading into this European qualifying set of fixtures. We have France away on Friday and then England coming to town on Tuesday at the Aviva for what should be an absolutely brilliant game. And if you haven't got your tickets, anyone that's listening, please do get them and come along. Myself and Karen will be there so you can do some celeb spotting. Uh, that was totally a joke. Um, but Jilly, from an English point of view, how are you guys feeling going into these games? Well, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's a hard draw for England. I do. I, I think, um, obviously, France and Sweden, and I think it's going to be, obviously, difficult. I think they're both top teams. And I also think, like, I, I mean, I'm excited to see the England versus Ireland. I think it fiery game, maybe with a few individu individuals, really, in the sense when I talk about that. But I don't think... Um, for one second, it's going to be easy for England. And I think coming off, obviously, the back of the Nations League, which they should have done a lot better in, you know, and obviously you're looking at, they would have looked at, they should have beat the Netherlands, and they should have beat Belgium, and they should have topped that group. That, that don't mean nothing. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter in your, where your standings are or who's favourite. At the end of the day, like I say, it's, it's a football game, and it's whoever turns up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm off to Wembley on Friday for that game. Um, so I'm, ex I'm excited for it, but I, yeah, I don't think it'll be an easy task for England. 
We hope not from an Irish perspective anyways, if we have to if we have to have any hope going into these. One of the things that I thought was interesting, I saw a lot of English fans commentating on over the last couple of days was when our squad was announced and Anna Patton was in there playing with England at underage level. There hadn't really been any indications over this side of the water that the, that was coming in was something that she was contemplating. And I saw a couple of people discussing the English youth structures and maybe a little bit of concern about those players who did feature really prominently, but now are just like finding it really hard to get into what is an extremely competitive and pretty set squad as well. You really need to be performing and like wowing people to get into that England squad with Serena Wiegmann. Yeah, and then listen, in all honesty, when I was in the England youth, um, it got to the, I think, the under-21s, under-23s at the time, and I couldn't get a look in. And I was actually looking at my Irish roots to come over, but unfortunately it was my, even though I've got the Irish surname, it was my great-nan. So I couldn't mm. I couldn't get it. But if, if I'd have had my nan or granddad was enough that I could have gone, I would have gone over because I think... And that was back then, you know, that was obviously back then in, in, a few years ago. But it is difficult and it's, you know, England do have such a good youth setup, and there's a lot of players that will play all the games in the youth setup and will never feature for England seniors. That's just the way the football is. And I think players are now, it, they know it's, it's even more difficult. The more successful England are, it's even, even harder to get in. Um, and they want to play English, uh, they want to play international football. So there's even, there's a couple of players who, like London City players who've gone over and played for Wales and I think she's a very good, talented centre-half. She likes to play football. You know, she's come from a, a great start in regards to Arsenal, you know, and I think she'll be a great addition to, to Ireland. Well, Karen, when we were discussing it earlier, had her walking straight into our team despite our illustrious options in defence. Well, it's generally one of our better placed uh better place yeah, positions it is, on I mean, the team. She's just, she's just playing at, at a high level and, and that can't be ignored. So if she comes in and she makes any sort of impression, I think it's really hard to ignore it. And like Julie's talking about, it's getting harder and harder for girls featuring at underage England set up to break into the senior squad. That's going to become the case for Ireland as well, unless we really focus on our grassroots because there's going to continue to be an influx of players from... England or Wales or Scotland, whoever has the heritage, unless we really look after our underage structures. So we probably need to be looking at what England are doing and the rate that they're producing this talent and at least be able to compete with this on, you know, an international level, because at the end of the day, it's an Irish national team and like you have to have homegrown talent in there as well. So it's brilliant to have the likes of Anna Patton coming into the squad, but as well, it should be a little bit of a, a warning fire for us that we need to look after our underage structures and we need to look at developing a professional league here because we've got no one from our league currently in this squad and while that was expected it's not a brilliant reflection on on where we are at mm. the ground and it just shows the the levels that we have to get to um in order to to bring our national team to the next step and make success a continuous thing because you're you can't always rely on you know the granny rule mm. <laughs> But we love a good granny roll, though. No. We do. We do. It's benefited <laughs> us an awful lot, we have to say. And I, I don't begrudge anyone um, playing international football or if they've got that heritage. Um, it's just important that we don't become reliant on it. it mm. Because at the end of the day, it's it's England's conveyor base, belt of talent that we're benefiting off and, and that might not always be the case. Mm. Safe to say as well, Julie, that if you had qualified for Ireland, we would have very happily accepted you into the fold. And Thanks, that's, that's really We still would. <laughs> <laughs> um, to look at some of the weekend's action, start with the Conti Cup because it had so many different talking points and the thing we're probably all concentrated on after the game was the interaction between Jonas Edevel and Emma Hayes where she rejected his handshake gave him a little shove walked away after the way that he spoke or the way that she felt he spoke to Aaron Cuthbert during the game i feel like that has overshadowed what was quite a dramatic match in that you had Frida Manum collapsing off the ball arsenal released a statement today saying that she was conscious the whole time they're continuing to do tests but she's in good form which is really positive because when you see something like that happen on the pitch 
your heart immediately drops and you just don't know what to expect. So it's great that she's doing well. But Stina Blaxenius as well, popping up once again. Jilly, putting the haze and stuff aside for a moment, this actual game, a lot of people were saying it was more important for Arsenal than it was for Chelsea. I don't think that was necessarily true. I think it puts a different slant on Arsenal's season, yes. But also, I think those failures when it comes to the league and the Champions League are still very much going to be at the forefront for them. Yeah, well, I think this and I think it's... I don't think for either club it was more important, but I think for Arsenal, they had to win something this year. Um, and I think the they obviously they they had a bad start to the season not even getting into the Champions League getting knocked out of them they was in the running with the title they then lose points there they then come up against Man City in the FA Cup and they literally lose that so really see all they had to fight for was the Continental Cup and you know it is sort of Arsenal's trophy because they've won it so many times over the years but there was I think pressure on them to, to, to win it and to to get a trophy, especially on, on Jonas as well. And the fans were wanting it. But also you're looking at Emma that for Chelsea there was all this talk in the past three, four months of the quadruple. Are they gonna do it? Are they gonna do it? And Chelsea just have no luck with this trophy whatsoever. And to ask it was are oh, the quadruples not happening. The quadruple um Emma's of the out of the way. That's not happening. So now it's what's next. Um and I, I just found, though, out of all the games that Chelsea and Arsenal played against each other this season, that was probably the most boring one, in my opinion. So boring. And it was because I think both teams were, yeah, so both teams were so reserved with it mm. because it's, it's hard to go because when they, they've played each other, it's not been like a 1-0 or 2-0, it's been like a 3-4-1 either side. So I think, I thought Chelsea was going to go in there the stronger one because they'd sort of got one over on Arsenal only a few weeks ago. But it was just the complete opposite. And I felt like it was both teams very reserved. Both teams are afraid to make a mistake because they didn't want the other one to punish them. And pressure's on both clubs to bring the trophy home in, in, for different reasons. Definitely. And Karen, I think I totally agree with you that it was quite a boring game. And when you look at the uh, Arsenal men's side, it was just a general day for it, I think, um, in that they were up against opponents that, have got the better of them before, but also knew that they could go toe to toe with. So there was almost a lack of creativity or a lack of willing to maybe try anything too adventurous. Yeah, a little bit. I think that the most recent match would have been a, a massive factor um, in the the game. They they really fell apart against Chelsea in that league game. But Adavel talked about them managing pressure situations and it's easier to manage a pressure situation if you're given a very stringent job and you say, okay, let's nullify the opponent and work our way into the game. Then it's just that it never really kicked on. It never really came to light uh, or came to life on either side. If maybe the, the goal ruled out for far had been allowed, I think maybe we would have seen a more end to end battle, but Arsenal really didn't, want to go down the route they did obviously and and capitulate the way they didn't as in the league so um i understand why their tactics were the way they were um and at the end of the day they came out with a trophy from that and they can reference this as they go into next season i think that's important they can say okay well we beat chelsea because we were able to manage the occasion we need to start doing that more consistently so as well as it putting a more positive spin on their season it, it gives them a little bit of a platform mentally for next year, which I think was important for them because I think there was a lot of questions around them after that last Chelsea result and probably rightfully so and questions around Adeville and rightfully so. And I think, yeah, he does. He, he likes, he's always involved, isn't he? He is always involved. <laughs> has he, that head on him. He has, he's weird because he, I actually view him as quite a bland man. But he seems to attract the ire of his opposition managers quite a lot. You've had Gareth Taylor before saying that he should have been sent off for the way he was talking to assistant managers during the game. And then Emma Hayes as well, the whole incident at the weekend. And the two of them have had a constant back and forth over the years. Compared to her relationship with Taylor, there's been a lot more public jabbing at each other between Edeval and Hayes. You know, you had Hayes 
meowing in a press conference because <laughs> Jonas Eideval <laughs> said that he didn't like black cats, which, you know, it's just a statement that I never thought I would say on the radio, but here we are. Um, do you think, Jilly, that, like, did things get a little <laughs> bit overboard on Sunday? Because I think, you know, whatever about the show, I think that was neither here nor there. But I think some of the comments afterwards from Emma Hayes were maybe a little bit misplaced in terms of the seriousness Main of things. aggression. Is it that? Yeah, the male aggression. Yeah, yeah. I love male aggression and then the clip is of her pushing him. So it's all a bit like, you know, it's a bit of a hypocritical in that sense. Um, but I think, listen, I think, I said this yesterday, that it, things get very tense in football. And I would be probably the first person in a game to row with my centre forward that I'm marking. I'd want to offer him out. I'd want to fight him. I'd want to do everything to him. And as soon as the final whistle went, I'd give him a hug and I'd give him an eye five. And I think it's just sometimes knowing that when the whistle goes, it's just left there. Do you know what I mean? It's not personal. But I do think they've had a bit of back and forth since. I think it all started when Jonas beat Emma at the Emirates and done a knee slide. Mm. <laughs> I think that is... Um, but I just think, like... The incident that they're talking about on, on Sunday was that Chelsea had wanted a one-ball system and Arsenal wanted a multi-ball system. Now, that gets decided the week of the final. Then in the game, Chelsea are losing. So, Erin Cuthbert, the ball goes out and Erin Cuthbert wants to go and get a ball quickly to play on. So, Jonas, you can see him. He's very animated, saying, no, 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 no. Like, obviously, that's not what you've asked for. Now, obviously, you see Erin go back at him, but... There's no mic stand there for us to hear what is actually being said between them. It's just, obviously, Erin's gone towards him. Whatever's happened, happened. So, obviously, that's then her point of saying that he was obviously aggressive on the sideline and that he's obviously should have been probably sent off and stuff. But, obviously, no one is really any the wiser what was actually said between any of them down there. Um, but you can probably understand Jonas's frustration in the sense of, well, hold on a minute, you wanted one thing and then we go one new up and now you want the other thing that you didn't want. Um, so it's, it's a bit tit for tat, really, isn't it? It's a bit like, come yeah. on, you know, the, the bigger picture of it all. But I do think that the result and everything else has probably been not tarnished, but the talking point is them too, rather than actually the game of football. Yeah, and it wasn't much. Like, I would know from my own experience, if, if I give it, to a manager and if they're a male or a female and they give it back to me, that's fair enough because I've probably started it. Or like, it's just part of the the in-game kind of emotions of it. I, I, I think as long as it doesn't spill to the post-match stuff, which Emma Hayes let it, um, I think that's the only disappointing thing that that, that became the talking point. As, like if you have a little spat on the sideline, it doesn't get picked up as much by the cameras, doesn't get as honed in on um, by social media. And I think that's, that's all it is, really. It's just what to do it about nothing because there wasn't a huge amount of other highlights from the game. Yeah, well, we all know Emma Hayes. She is not a fond loser. It is not her favourite thing to do. So possibly slightly unsurprising that she was a little bit sore after that game, especially with the, it going to extra time and everything. Um, Karen, I want to quickly touch on your beloved Manchester United because a big win for them at the weekend, uh, we see Ella Toon hitting a milestone for United, becoming the first female player to score 50 goals for them, getting that brace over Everton in a 4-1 win. Slightly surprising scoreline, you'd have to say. I feel like Everton haven't really been at the end of any massive hidings and you would have, have felt that United this season is massively far ahead of them. Yeah, they they haven't been in the way United have been playing. You wouldn't expect them to be putting four goals because they haven't been overly prolific. But you know, Everton they they they've had to you know rotate a good bit recently as well. And I think that they've done as well as they could up to this point. And there's going to be games like this when you have that rotation and that inconsistency in their team. Um, and Man United really needed a a big result. It's still disappointing that it took for them to go a goal down and for it to be the second half for United to really stamp their authority on the game. And again, it was Millie Turner kind of set piece that they were relying on, but I'm really, I'm really happy for, for Ella Toon because, you know, with the departures that happened during the summer, she really was, she's the talisman of the team, her and Mary Earps. And then there was all the 
speculation around Mary Earps's future. So a lot was falling on Ella Toon's feet and she just isn't getting the same supply and the same link up play that she would have been with Russo. So it's been hard for her. So for her to get two goals and reach that that milestone, it's it's great for her. It's it's great for, for Man United. Um 